Hello and welcome to this edition of Live and Ticking, which will focus on the topic of how sleep affects the heart. I'm Fergal McKinney, Head of British Heart Foundation, Northern Ireland. Sleep is crucial for our overall health and research has shown that it can have a profound impact on the health of our heart. Chronic sleep deprivation is associated with an increased risk of high blood pressure, diabetes, obesity and heart disease. However, now more than ever, it can be difficult to wind down to a good night's sleep. Is it the blue light from our phones to blame, or maybe it's the constant connectivity and information overload that comes with these devices? Busy lifestyles often lead to a sacrifice of sleep in favour of social commitments, caring duties and work. But what effect is this having on our cardiovascular health? To talk through this, we'll be hearing from former BHF funded researcher, Dr. Sophie Bostock, also known as the sleep scientist. You may have seen her on this morning or caught her TED talk. And in 2021, she rode around the coast of Great Britain and raised an amazing 10,000 pounds for the BHF. We're very excited to have Sophie here with us today, and she's going to help us understand just how important sleep really is we're also delighted to be joined by Alice Timmons. Alice is a heart patient and BHF supporter. She'll be talking about her experience of heart attack and stroke and her personal story of how this impacted her sleep. If you've any questions for our speakers, you can submit them via the Q&A function throughout the talks. We'll also be joined by BHF senior cardiac nurse, Regina Giblin, for questions and we'll try to answer as many as possible during the Q&A section. If you're unable to answer your question, if we're unable to answer your question, then you can call our heart helpline and speak directly to one of our cardiac nurses. You can also join our Health Unlocked community forum for support. This forum provides a safe space to discuss living with any heart or circulatory diseases. We're also proud to announce as part of this year's BHF Heart Hero Awards, the Research Story of the Year Award will be decided on a public vote you are all invited to explore three finalists and vote for your favorite BHF funded research project to win. Each innovative project seeks to tackle some of the biggest challenges in heart and circulatory disease. The projects range from aiming to deliver a cure for inherited heart muscle disease to using artificial intelligence and heart imaging to detect heart disease at record speed to the development uh, of a heart plaster to treat children with congenital heart disease. To discover more details about each project and cast your vote, visit the link in the chat below. Finally, before we hear from our speakers, I'd like to ask you a quick poll question. And could you tell us how would you rate your understanding of how sleep affects the heart? And of course, that rating is from one to five. I'll just give you a little moment to um, uh, vote and uh, then we'll continue with our session. I'd like to introduce our first speaker today, Alice Timmons. Alice will talk through her journey with Rob Underwood from the Heart Stories team at the BHF. Welcome, Alice and Rob. Right, well, thanks very much indeed. And uh, first of all, Alice, hello and Hi, welcome. Um, thank you so much. Thank you for being with us and uh, thanks for being part of our live and ticking conversation about uh, how sleep affects the heart. I mean, it's most important, isn't it? We all realise what a good night's sleep is. And I think it would be really interesting, first of all, for our viewers to maybe learn a little more about you briefly. Tell us, if you would, some more about your work background, your family, your general interests as well. Very quickly, I'm, you obviously know my name. I'm 69. Uh, I live in Glasgow with my daughter and son-in-law, who are both paramedics, which is very handy and my two grandchildren who are 16 and 7. Um, my background is I've, I've worked in health and social care for most of my life, uh, particularly in older people services, but I started working life as a journalist. Um, did that until about 1980, started my nurse training. Um, my second placement was in older people services, and I was so horrified at what I saw and how we treated older people that that became my path, my career pathway basically for the rest of my life. Um, I left nursing in the early 90s to move to social work, just when social work was opening up to people with different qualifications. 
And again, I specialised in older people services. Um, moved into quality assurance in social work. So was doing uh, contract monitoring of nursing homes and care homes and quality assurance for social work services. Um, eventually, when the Care Inspectorate, which is the Scottish version of CQC, started in 2002, I moved there and ran a team of people who um, did inspections, investigated complaints, etc., for care services in Scotland. So that was my kind of career pathway and, and older people and, and how they're treated in health and care settings has, has been my passion for a long time. In 2010, I suffered a stroke. At this, in the same week as my partner was diagnosed with what turned out to be terminal cancer. So that was a fairly difficult time. Um, and I ended up giving up work in 2011, becoming self-employed and did consultancy work again with care homes for older people. So I'm probably that most dangerous of people, someone with a little bit of knowledge about what's happening to me. The... Um, Stroke in 2010 was peculiar. I didn't have typical sy symptoms. Um, my symptoms were intermittent. Um, I had slight weakness in the right side, lightheaded, etc. And it took three days in an MRI to find the cause, to find that I actually had had a stroke. Um, the, the two biggest and most lasting issues were that I lost my internal calendar. I cannot remember appointments. I can't remember where I'm going, when I'm going. So I have to keep a diary and people have to remind me. But the other one is sleep. Um, almost instantly, my eight hours and out became um, bursts of three to four hours of sleep. And I basically spent the next decade trying to find a way um, find methods to help me get some sleep. Um, it's a really, a really challenging time for you, as you say, Alice, uh, 2010, mm -hmm. so much to process, so much to deal yeah. with. Um, let's go forward, if we may, to your heart attack. Um, this was during the pandemic, the COVID-19 lockdown, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Going back to that day, what, what do you remember feeling? Um, Nothing much. <laughs> I had been uh, having investigations and medication for um, indigestion for about a year. And I, on that particular day, um, the indigestion was lasting longer than it normally would. It wasn't terribly painful. I wasn't feeling nauseous. I didn't have any symptoms apart from this discomfort in my, my stomach that came up into my chest and my throat. And I had an appointment, a telephone appointment. It was this, the start of the second week of the first lockdown. So there were no appointments. There was nobody seeing anyone. But I already had a telephone appointment arranged with my GP about the indigestion. Um, and again, that having little knowledge is a dangerous thing. I said to him, this doesn't feel quite right. And I'm a bit concerned there might be something cardiac. He did send me to the medical receiving unit. Um, my local hospital. I had an ECG, which was perfectly normal. I had bloods taken, which showed that my troponin, the, the enzyme that increases when you have a heart attack, was slightly above normal, but nothing like what you would expect in a, in a heart attack. Um, but they admitted me anyway, and everyone kept saying, we don't think there's anything happening, but we'll, we'll keep an eye on you. We'll just keep you for a bit. Um, next morning, I saw a cardiac nurse specialist who absolutely saved my life um, because I was supposed to go home and she said no I'd rather you went to the specialist centre for an angiogram and I was sent for an angiogram and I heard the one thing that you do not want to hear in a cardiologist's voice which was shock and surprise uh, and I can remember him saying that that vessel is completely blocked it's completely there's no blood getting through at all and then I thought I'd fallen asleep and I woke up with a start worrying that I had snored and waked myself up. Um, but then he told me that I'd actually had a cardiac arrest and my heart stopped and they'd had to shock me a couple of times to get me back. So, and, so sorry. Tell us, tell us, if I may just interrupt a little bit, but tell us how your life 
further changed after that heart attack? We'd already talked about the initial yeah. sleep issues following your stroke. How did how did your sleep pattern, your, your sleep issues further change after that? And how did it begin to impact on your everyday life, Alice? What, what was said to me at the time was that I had fairly minor damage in terms of the pumping capacity of my heart. But about eight months, eight, nine months later, I began to get symptoms of breathlessness, swelling my legs, etc. And I suppose the first thing that alerted me was... Um, I'm very conscious of sleep because of my sleep problems, was I was wheezing and coughing at night when I was trying to sleep. If I lay flat, I would cough and I would wheeze. And having problems already staying asleep, which was the main thing for me, I found that I was waking up after maybe two hours feeling as though I was choking. As though there was something, not that I couldn't breathe, as though I was actually choking. Um, I spoke to my GP and started on a diuretic frusamide to, to clear fluid. And that certainly makes a huge difference. That makes things much, much easier. Um, I keep pillows, extra pillows, so that I can sit up because lying flat can be quite difficult. You become quite, quite congested feeling. Um, so I keep extra pillows so that I can sit up and, and it eases my breathing. Um, it's difficult to say how it's affected in terms of sleep because it was already so bad and I already had spent 10, 12 years researching what helped me because everyone's so different. Um, and I had lots of physical techniques. I think what happened after the heart attack was the, the issues became more mental than physical. That four o'clock in the morning, waking up in a fright um, and I'd mentioned in earlier conversations that the anxiety is much more heightened in the early hours and having had just had a heart attack waking up feeling that I couldn't breathe properly um, because it was in the lockdown there wasn't a lot of support around there was no kind of backup and that was a, a very lonely and very dark dark place um, and I think that was that's probably where the British Heart Foundation became most useful for me most helpful um, to be able to speak to someone um, one of the I spoke to one of the, the clinical nurses one of the cardiac nurses at a point where I was very very low very down and didn't have clarity I couldn't contact cardiologist GP wasn't available um, I knew enough to frighten myself so to be able to speak to somebody who had knowledge um, and having that contact with people who understood why I was afraid, you know, was, was absolutely invaluable. invaluable. The, nights, the nights can be very long, long can't it? And, and a oh, lonely yeah. place, as you say, when your sleep is, is interrupted. I'm right. interested just to pick up briefly on a couple of points you mentioned about techniques there, and I'm sure yeah. viewers will be interested as well. What, what other techniques did you, did you explore that, that you found worked for you? I think, as I say, I, th I think that they split into two they go to the physical and the mental. Um, personally, I find the mental more of a problem. And I was fortunate enough when I had my stroke to have psychology input. And I used mindfulness techniques where those circular thoughts at four o'clock in the morning, it helps to be able to recognize them, face them and send them off. Um, I also found for me, there is no point lying there worrying that I can't get back to sleep. I do something to distract myself, whether it's reading or playing a, a, a silly game on my phone, something that distracts my mind from worrying about not sleeping. Um, physically, I now have this solid routine. I have blinds, blackout blinds covered by blackout curtains because sleep light coming in will waken you. I use wax earplugs. I have tried... The one thing I would be confident in recommending is wax earplugs because I've tried every other kind and that keeps the noise out because the smallest noise will waken you as well. Um, I keep extra pillows so that if I do get a bit breathless, I feel a bit congested, I raise, I, I sleep semi-recumbent, semi-lying down and that's really useful. And I try to keep the head of the bed raised generally, both for the indigestion, which is still there, 
uh, and for the, the feeling of, of not being able to breathe properly. Um, I've used various, I've tried various medications and had some not great experiences because of the medication. When you've had stroke and heart attack, you're on lots and lots of medications. And I've had two episodes of interactions between drugs I've taken. So I'm very, very careful about taking medication. I would want to say, don't be in pain. I think that's it. Pain medication, take paracetamol, whatever you need to take, because that will waken you, sure as anything. You're in an, Sorry. Ideal, you're in an ideal position, that's fine. Um, you're in an ideal position, aren't you, to, to offer advice to, to anybody who might be in a, a similar situation to yourself. What would, what would that message be, would you say, briefly? What works for everyone else may not work for you. Don't give up. Keep researching. Keep asking. If anyone suggests anything, try it. It may not work for you, but you may find a miracle somewhere. There will be something. Um, and as I've only recently discovered British Heart Foundation's helpline, I would use, use things like that. See what's out there. You don't have to be isolated and be alone. There are things there, but you need to go and look for them. You need to look hard. It's a positive and encouraging message to end on. Alice, thank you so much for sharing you. Very your, your story with us. And uh, I do hope you'll find this, this event helpful. And on that note, Fergal, back to you. Thank, thank you, Rob. You. And thank you very much indeed, uh, indeed, Alice, for sharing your story uh, so, so fully. Um, you'll see that somebody's already dropped a question into the Q&A uh, link there at the bottom of the page. And just feel free to ask questions of Alice, our next speaker. And our second speaker today is Dr. Sophie Bostock, who's going to explain how sleep works and how we can get more of it. Over to you, Sophie. Oh, thanks so much, Fergal. And um, brilliant, Alice, thank you so much. I loved your message at the end there. That's kind of, you know, we're all different and don't be afraid to experiment. And the, the only reason I call myself a sleep scientist really just is to encourage people to become scientists of their own sleep. And I can give you the core information that kind of controls the timing and quality of your sleep, which I will do very shortly. Um, but there is an awful lot of natural variation. So we'll definitely kind of emphasize that point. Um, but Fergal, I thought it might be helpful. The first question that we had was, you know, how much, how well do you understand how sleep impacts the heart? So I thought I might start with that, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Nodding vigorously. Okay, so um, those of you who can kind of, Everybody knows that sleep's important, but we maybe don't understand exactly the mechanisms how sleep uh, supports the heart. So I thought it might be helpful to think about what happens during a typical night. Uh, so if you're lucky, um, when you put your head on the pillow and you close your eyes, you'll start off in something called stage one sleep, which is the lightest form of sleep. It's not very restorative. It's the same kind of sleep that you get when you press the snooze button in the morning. Uh, and there was a recent study that showed that that the more times you press the snooze button, the longer it takes you to feel alert in the morning. So if I were you, I would ditch that snooze. Um, after about 10 minutes, we get into stage two sleep, which is also called true sleep. And our heart rates and breathing rates start to slow down. And most of us will spend about half of our nights in this stage two sleep. And I think you could all already sort of say that the, the cardiovascular system is starting to recover at this point. Everything's slowing down, uh, body temperature is starting to dip. Uh, but after about 30 or 40 minutes, in an ideal world, we get into something called stage three or deep, slow wave sleep. And this is the part of sleep that is incredibly physically restorative. And there's loads of juicy stuff going on, particularly to protect the heart. We've got uh, inflammation being mopped up. Our immune system is going to work. It's fighting infection. Um, inflammation, of course, that kind of underlying process where uh, we start to build up kind of fatty deposits in the arteries and which interfere with blood flow. Um, but also our stress hormones are dipping to their lowest levels. So the stress hormone cortisol is really kind of getting to its lowest levels, allowing growth hormone to do its work, repairing damaged cells. Um, so deep, slow wave sleep is like this elixir of life. Like we all want as much of it as we possibly can. Um, and the bad news for most of us is that as we get older, we actually get less deep sleep. Uh, so we'll, we'll come into onto what 
with, for what to do about that. But definitely deep sleep, super helpful for the heart. And we swing back after deep sleep into another type of sleep called REM, rapid eye movement sleep, which is usually associated with dreaming. And both deep sleep and REM sleep, really important for memory consolidation. But we think that REM sleep is also really important for emotional balance. And, you know, Alice has mentioned, you know, that horrendous feeling you wake up in the middle of the night and you feel super anxious, really isolated. And part of the reason is that when we're sleep deprived, it kind of ramps up our stress response. Our stress system is constantly in flux. We're either in kind of fight or flight, energized and ready to go, or we're in kind of rest or digest. To get into slow wave sleep, and all those lovely restorative processes, we've got to be in rest or digest. So we need to switch off that stress response. And one of the barriers that we get to is if you are sleep deprived, your brain actually responds by flicking you into fight or flight more of the time. So it's very natural when you are having a period of poor sleep to feel more anxious, not just at night, but also during the day. So I, I think that's helpful to know about, you know, you get this kind of hijack when you're short of sleep, but it actually kind of shapes the way you see the world. So don't necessarily feel that, you know, there's something really wrong with you. It may well just be that, that sleep disruption is, is interfering with that stress regulation. So um, we cycle through uh, all the different stages of sleep during the night. We naturally wake up many times through the night in between sleep cycles. Now, a good sleeper kind of isn't really aware they don't become uh, fully conscious during these brief arousals. They'll just kind of get into the next sleep cycle. As we get older, our sleep naturally becomes lighter, a little bit more fragmented, a little bit more fragile. So noises and changes in temperature are more likely to wake you up as you get older. So I often, you have a lot of spend a lot of time just reassuring people that just because you wake up during the night, it doesn't mean you have a sleep problem. It could just be a natural gap in between sleep cycles, this kind of natural point of, of lighter sleep. So that's the first thing to kind of reassure yourself. Um, I would say that unfortunately, high levels of inflammation, for example, if you recently had a stroke or a heart attack or high blood pressure or high blood sugar also, if you um, suffer from diabetes, all of those things can disrupt the quality of your sleep. So you're less likely to get lots of that deep, slow wave sleep. So particularly after an acute event, sleep problems are incredibly common. So I want to, again, just kind of reassure you that if your sleep has become disrupted, this could be a very much a natural part of the process of coping uh, with an acute or chronic, chronic illness. Okay, so the big question then is, all right, we've established sleep, really important for the, for the heart. Uh, we've established that actually it maybe gets a little bit harder as we get older. So what can we do about it? Are you ready for this? Right, okay. So there are three systems which control how well we sleep. And we can basically use levers that affect any one of those three. So the first one is circadian rhythms. The second one is sleep pressure. And the third one is managing your stress system. And it's really interesting to me that um, Alice has actually kind of come up with a few strategies which impact particularly the stress system, but also sort of circadian rhythms. So let's start with this one. Circadian rhythms, these are also called your body clocks. And over the last couple of years, we've discovered that we have body clocks all over our bodies. Every single cell in our body contains instructions to tick over every 24 hours. So it's not just sleep and alertness that is controlled by this 24 hour rhythm. It's also our appetite, our mood, our immune function, our digestion. And so the number one way to improve not only your sleep, but also your overall energy levels and um, physical function is actually to stick to the same wake up time every single day. And you might have heard this before, but the, the goal here is to get all of your internal rhythms in sync with each other. So a regular routine, waking up at the same time, we know is protective for the heart. Now we also know, I know that Alice's um, family work as paramedics, 
they're shift workers, which means that their circadian rhythms are being push-pulled an awful lot of the time. And that puts the body under additional stress. So if that's the case for you, you kind of have to dial up the other ways of looking after your health, you know, regular exercise, a healthy nutrition to help to kind of compensate for this stressor. But if you are in control of your daily rhythms, getting up at the same time, going to bed at a similar time, seven days a week will work wonders. The other thing that is really important influence on controlling those circadian rhythms is light and in particular bright light so bright light within the first hour of the day is going to kick start your body clock for the day make you feel energized you want to actually get to get as much natural daylight as possible and if you can't get outside perhaps you're not as mobile as you used to be make sure that you're next to a window for as much of the day as possible um, that has a really positive impact not just on your sleep but also on your mood and concentration and Alice made a wonderful point about darkness at night Again, quite a new area for research. People have taken it for granted for a long time that, yeah, probably we need the, the room to be dark. But actually, even low levels of light can keep your body a little bit in fight or flight. There was a recent study that found that even having a nightlight on, um, hardly enough to read by, actually kept the heart at a higher heart rate overnight and increased insulin resistance, which is that kind of hallmark uh, sort of sign of increased rate of diabetes the next morning. So even in healthy people, too much light at night seems to keep us at this higher level of arousal. So for more deep sleep, dark at night or an eye mask uh, is going to work a treat. So that's circadian rhythms. Second one is sleep pressure. It's all right, Fergal. That one's a bit more straightforward. I promise not to take too much time. Um, we kind of want to leave some for questions. Um, but if you can look after your circadian rhythms, sleep pressure, really straightforward. The longer you have been awake, the more sleep pressure builds up and your brain really wants to sleep. So this is really helpful because if you struggle to fall asleep at night, one of the simplest things to do, counterintuitive though it may sound, is just to go to bed a bit later. Only get into bed when you're actually sleepy tired, when you feel your eyelids getting heavy. Um, there's a lot of scare stories around about the amount of sleep that we need. And for most adults, the recommendation is to get between seven and nine hours sleep every night. But it's a bell-shaped curve. So most of us sit between seven and nine hours. As we get older, our sleep need reduces a little bit. So if you're over 65, the recommendation is seven to eight hours. But sleep scientists acknowledge that there are some people for whom five hours or six hours or even nine hours might be the right amount. And this goes back to the great point that Alice made that we are all different. No one else can tell you your sleep need. So if you're getting five or six hours, but you actually feel quite alert during the day, you're not relying on caffeine or sugar or really long naps during the day, that might be right for you. Uh, so don't be afraid maybe to go to bed a little bit later if you're not tired. Caffeine, of course, uh, blocks sleep pressure temporarily, makes you feel a little bit more alert, but can disrupt quality of your sleep later. So generally speaking, the recommendation is not to have uh, caffeine kind of after uh, two o'clock in the afternoon or at least six hours before bed. All right, final, third and final um, system which influences your sleep is that stress system. So I've talked about the fact that we're all either in fight or flight or rest or digest. And it turns out if we spend too much of our time or too late in the day in that fight or flight um, activated state, of course, it's going to be much harder to fall asleep. Our, our evolutionary uh, response to being in a stressful environment is to switch things on, to energize us, increase tension. So one of the best ways to get into a deep sleep is to convince the brain and body that you are safe, that you, it's okay to switch off. It's okay to be calm, safe, positive. Those are the types of emotions that you want to evoke, particularly in that last hour before bed. So having a regular bedtime routine is not just for kids, it's for adults too. Um, doing the same things in the same order to help you switch off, the brain goes up, yeah, I know what's going to happen next. And it kind of eases you into sleep. Um, do something in the evening that you enjoy that helps you to relax. And that might be 
coloring in, it might be listening to music, it might be doing meditation. And I love the fact that Alice mentioned mindfulness. Uh, it was actually the topic of my PhD uh, funded by the British Heart Foundation. And I was able to look at mindfulness as an intervention, not just for reducing stress and helping people regulate their emotions, but a side effect that we found was that people improved their sleep. So mindfulness is simply the practice of recognizing thoughts and emotions with curiosity and acceptance and letting them go rather than letting those kind of negative thoughts ruminate in your mind and kind of ramping up the stress response. So definitely a helpful technique. Um, that is a whistle stop tour. I feel like I've spoken for a long time, uh, but I've given you hopefully a little framework to uh, understand a little bit more about sleep in the heart. Sophia could listen to you all day. Thank you very much. That was brilliant. Um, just a reminder, you can put your questions into the Q&A box and some of you have been doing that already. Uh, we're now going to welcome back all speakers for the Q&A part of the event, along with Regina Giblin, our senior cardiac nurse, who's here to help answer audience questions. Um, I'm going to pick them on the basis of their votes, upvotes, even if somebody has put one in from the very start. So the one uh, this question was interesting to me actually too, and this is from Jeanette Nelson, and I think it's for you, Sophie. What would happen to the heart if your sleep is disturbed by frequent trips to the bathroom? Great question and very common uh, for a lot of us. And I would say waking up a couple of times during the night does not mean that you've got poor sleep. As I've said, we have natural breaks between sleep cycles. And if we think back from an evolutionary perspective, Waking up a few times to check that you're safe and your family's safe is an entirely natural way to sleep. So I know that like we've all got these idealized memories of being kind of a uh, teenager or a young adult or a kid and sleeping through the night. Um, but as we get older, our sleep naturally isn't necessarily like that. So I would say if you're waking up a couple of times a night, if you're managing to fall back to sleep again afterwards, that doesn't suggest to me that you necessarily have a sleep problem. If it feels like it's really hard to go back to sleep or you're feeling really tired during the day as a result, that's when you kind of need to take some proactive action. Okay. Uh, you've touched on it already, but and you've also touched on the fact that we're all individuals. But an anonymous attendee is asking, how much sleep do I really need? As a, is, is that a distinction between what you described before? Um, no, not really. And But there are loads of terrifying studies. I've got like, some of you probably will have read uh, Why We Sleep and, uh, or at least kind of started reading it and then got too scared and not read the rest. And some of it's a little bit kind of sensationalized. And it suggests that if you're not getting seven hours of sleep a night, then you're in real trouble. And it is true that people who sleep routinely fewer than six hours or more than nine hours uh, have been linked to increased rates of heart disease and a whole number of other conditions. So there's no doubt that it's important. But those kind of increased risks, we're talking about maybe a sort of a 20% increased risk. So if you don't smoke and you exercise regularly, the chances are that you can reduce that risk back down again. It's not the only thing that influences heart health. So I would kind of like, uh, yeah, it's one factor definitely that was, is within our control, but try not to worry about that too much. And then the other thing is that these recommendations are based on the enormous populations and we're taking an average and there will always be people at the extremes. So just to give you a few kind of things to think about, if you are waking up without an alarm, feeling alert, you're not relying on caffeine or sugar, you're not having to have really long naps, like I've no issues with a kind of 10, 20 minute nap to kind of keep you going, particularly after lunch, uh, when we all tend to have a bit of dip in alertness. Um, if you don't need to kind of sleep in on weekends, if you generally feel that you're not too irritable and snappy and forgetful, which are all signs of lack of sleep, um, and you don't tend to doze off in the middle of a ticker talk uh, or when you're watching TV, these are all signs that you may well be getting enough sleep for you. Um, so very individual. One thing I would recommend, if you're kind of thinking, oh, I'm not sure, um, try and keep a sleep diary for a week. 
Um, there's a template actually on my website. I can find it. We can definitely share it. Um, but just write down for a week, what time are you going to bed? What time are you waking up? How do you feel during the day? Perhaps how long do you spend awake during the night? And if you track that for a week or two, it gives you something to go and discuss with your healthcare team and say, look, this is where I'm at. And you can maybe get some advice. And equally, you can try and change something and see whether it influences that kind of baseline that you've, you've started with. Thank you. Uh, Win Fanshawe asks, Alice is very articulate in her personal story. Winding the clock back, what could Alice have done in her younger years to help strengthen uh, her fight against such cardio challenges and threats? I'll actually ask Alice what her thoughts are on that first. And then Sophie, if you can come in on the back of that, is that okay? Alice, what could you have done differently or do you think you could have done? I, I think it's probably a question more for Sophie, but... Yeah, yeah. Um, Personally, I, I, my issues and family issues are around um, blood glucose levels. I, I know that I have a family history. And my, my daughter um, was recently diagnosed following a seizure, having had no diagnosis before, and she's been put on to a, a second medication and has suddenly lost three and a half stone over a four-week period. And her whole life has changed. Her whole demeanor has changed. So I think possibly if, if I could have done anything, I would have changed diet earlier. You know, I, I would have um, stayed away from carbohydrates because I know, again, because of my daughter's journey, I know that we both react very strongly to carbohydrates. And um, I, yeah, diet, diet and probably exercise, I would have caught on to earlier than I did, remembering when I was young and fit and could run up and down stairs and things. Um, mm. So those, those would be the things that I would have. Yeah, I suppose Alice's response there, Sophie, is back to your point. We're all individuals. We're all different. We all have our own experiences, et cetera. But in a general sense, what could people do differently? Yeah, I think Alice's suggestion is spot on, to be honest with you. Uh, there was a really interesting study that found uh, recently that actually people um, who exercise regularly didn't seem to have the same negative risks associated with lack of sleep when it came to heart health. So it felt like regular exercise is protective. And we know that regular exercise is protective, but this particular study kind of weighed the two up against each other. And I think gives us a bit of hope that, you know, even if we're going through a period of disrupted sleep, we can still support our body in other ways, which is one of the points I wanted to make. But also Alice mentioned um, control of blood sugar. And there was a study that came out literally last month, which looked specifically at deep, slow wave sleep and showed that that is the kind of sleep that actually seems to help us with our insulin sensitivity the next day. So it's just reinforcing what we already knew, that sleep quality is really important. And so these very simple things like a dark bedroom at night, getting plenty of daylight during the day, not eating too late at night is another one so that you have kind of high blood sugar kind of going into sleep. Um, all those things are going to help to promote the, the quality of your sleep. Um, from this is from an anonymous attendee, but they're asking why do older adults experience more sleep problems? Is there is there a thing? Such a great question, um, and, and we don't really understand. What we do know is that many of the symptoms, signs of chronic illness certainly influence sleep. So I've mentioned high blood sugar, high blood, high blood pressure, inflammation, um, also uh, beta amyloid in tau, nasty toxins that kind of get stuck around the brain um, and increase the risk of neurodegenerative diseases. All of those things seem to also disrupt sleep. Um, there are also hormonal challenges for women who are going through menopause um, and even many years post-menopause, we know that fluctuations to sex hormones will often disrupt sleep. So typically we tend to see higher rates of sleep problems in women than in men, but um, we see sleep problems throughout all age groups. Um, we also see positively great sleep at all age groups. So even though the rates of sleep problems increase with age, there is still a large population that sleep well. So I also want to give people confidence that it's not an inevitable kind of uh, result of aging. I think it just means that we need to focus more on the things we can do to support our natural sleep systems. 
Okay, uh, two specific um, questions now coming up relating to surgery and uh, heart and specific, specifically. Regina, can I bring you in? What are the best positions to sleep in after a procedure such as heart surgery or having stents fitted? Um, I would say uh, with heart surgery, if it's open heart surgery, um, you probably don't want to lie directly on your chest because that will cause more pain. Um, You've got like quite a big wound there and uh, you want to promote wound healing. And what we would say is to encourage people to hug pillows whenever they're recovering from heart surgery, because when they, ha when they have a cough or a sneeze or a laugh, it's really sensitive there. And, uh, you know, it's uh, it's good to have that extra support. So um, a fetal position is always a good position to be in at nighttime um, to have a pillow in between your your legs and to support your 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 back um, to have a pillow behind your back and to have two pillows um, just under your head. With stenting, it's really whatever position you, you find yourself in, whatever's comfortable. There's no specific um, for stenting procedures at all. You can sleep uh, whatever way you like, just comfortably. <laughs> and uh, and all the sleep tips that I mentioned earlier, like having the room dark and you know, also getting into routine, as uh, Sophie mentioned about um, before you go to bed, you know, having a relaxing routine. Some people like a bath, some people like to listen to music, try and not have any technology around you, like the blue light um, from your phone. Um, we all, uh, I know I have a habit of looking, scrolling through my phone and you, you might get stimulated by something you read and that keeps you awake, that keeps you thinking. So try, you know, an hour before you go to bed, try and not be, you know, scrolling on social media or watching television and just try and have a restful uh, sleeping environment, you know, Lavenders. I, I like to spray lavender on my pillow at night, for example. That really helps me sleep. And um, you know, just having a restful environment uh, within your within your within your room as well. Thank you, Regina, Jackie, and you can join in this one too, as well as Sophie. But thanks for the sleep tips, says Jackie P. He says he lives alone. Sorry, I'm making the assumption that he that he or she lives alone and had open heart mitral valve repair surgery in the pandemic in 2020. I'm also a retired police officer and get the 5.30 adrenaline rush every morning. I try to get six hours sleep. Any tips regarding that would be welcome. It's a lot worse if there's any anything especially worrying going on. I'm sure I'm not alone. And I suppose that does speak, Regina, to what you're talking about, stuff coming in from everywhere. That, uh, yeah. that you. But any thoughts? I think um, the early morning wakening, which Alice talked about and, and Sophie did as well, you know, it's that time in the morning when you wake up and everyone else is asleep. You're desperately trying to go back to sleep like everybody else is. You know, there's not necessarily anyone else to talk to. Um, and I think Alice made a really good point of, you know, try and not, you need to distract your mind. You know, try and not try, you get stressed about trying to go back to sleep, if you know what I mean. Um, so think of ways that helps you. Some people like to read something. Um, you know, some people like to listen to music, as I mentioned earlier. Um, but I think um, maybe a, a good idea, you know, about the routine is very important. Think about what time you're going to bed. It's possibly that their, their body's still in that routine of waking up early because, you know, they did that for so many years as a police officer. So maybe they need to change their, their time of going to bed so that they're actually ready for sleep and they, maybe they'll get past that 5.30 wakefulness. Um, but having your meals at regular times and taking exercise as well. Some people, if they take regular exercise um, an hour or so before bed, that fresh air, being outside in nature, you know, gets rid of those extra worries, those stresses. And um, some people find writing a to-do list before they go to bed as well, um, just to get empty your brain of all your thoughts um, can be helpful. Um, and the other thing I was thinking of um, was don't drink too much before you go to bed as well, because that obviously maybe prevents you waking up to go to the toilet. Um, obviously have some water nearby, um, you know, because we all get dry, dry mouth at times, but, you know, not drinking too much and, and thinking about other foods that, that may uh, prevent you from from getting a good night's rest uh, and, and things like not drinking caffeine or alcohol before you go to bed um, spicy foods can keep you awake um, yeah so these are the types of things I, I would I'd be thinking of um, to try and help uh, a longer sleep 
So if you have any thoughts on that, or let me just maybe ask another one. There's another one that's more upvoted, but this is just following through through as a theme, and it's probably nearly be thinking about the answers you've given, Regina. Why is it that even if you've tired yourself out, feel tired, and try all the things discussed today and more, that you still can't sleep? And they've added as well any additional tips for sleep in the menopause. Okay. So I think uh, this is probably relevant to the to previous question as well, but um, I referenced a little bit that the more you are sleep deprived, and in fact, the more you are experiencing chronic stress of any kind, and I would actually put lack of sleep down as a chronic stressor. It's one of those things that basically tips the switch so that you can get into a state where you just struggle to get out of that fight or flight, hyper aroused state. So even when you feel like you're relaxing, you know, you're sitting there watching the TV, you're like, yeah, I'm relaxed. Your body is not relaxed. You are still in this sort of state of arousal. And so you've actually got to proactively practice flipping the switch, not just at night, but also during the day. You know, what are you doing to relax, to take breaks, uh, going for a walk, as Regina said, um, just kind of getting your mind off the things which are bugging you. And when it comes to sleep, unfortunately, when you haven't slept well for a long time, the fact that you're not sleeping well becomes this massive source of stress. We've evolved so that if we're stressed, our brain wants to focus in on that thing that's stressing us out. And at three o'clock in the morning, that is the fact that we cannot sleep. So stop trying to sleep. Just accept you're not having a great night's sleep. Uh, you can try and do a relaxation strategy, a little bit of mindfulness. Um, but if after 15 or 20 minutes, you're still not asleep, that's okay. Just get out of bed, go somewhere else in your home, go and read a book, even watch TV, listen to some music until you start to feel your eyelids getting heavy. And only at that point, get back into bed. But what you don't want to do is get into the habit at four, five o'clock in the morning of trying really hard to sleep in your bed because in your brain learns that your bed is the place where you can't sleep. And you find that people, as soon as they get into their bedroom, the heart rate starts going. You know, they can sleep on the sofa, but they can't sleep in their bed. And it's because they've got this learned association, this kind of learned anxiety about sleep. So nip it in the bud. Just stop trying so hard to sleep. Allow it to happen. Create the conditions that you know are going to support good sleep. But if it's not happening for you, that's okay. Just push it back a little bit. The, the, the less sleep in a way that you have, the more sleep pressure builds. And then the following night, the likelihood is that you will sleep better. So again, don't be afraid of maybe going to bed a little bit later, building up a little bit more sleep pressure that will help you actually sleep through the night. Yeah. I have another specific question around that uh, in a moment, but um, Bernie asks, do fitness watches provide any useful information if you wear them when you're sleeping? I'm uh, I'm sort of mixed. I I wear them. I've I've tried various like rings and and wristbands and so on, and they're really pretty good for the number of hours that you've been asleep. However, for the detail of how much time you spend in different sleep stages, they are still not very accurate. Um, so the one I'm wearing actually was did a they did a validation study. They showed that it was. 50% accurate for the actual stages of sleep. Even the best ones are only 65% accurate, which is basically like a good guess. <laughs> so when you're looking at that data and it says, you've only had five minutes of deep sleep, please don't panic. You know, it doesn't mean that you only have five minutes of deep sleep. Um, how you feel is much more important than what that tracker says. I think the trackers can be helpful to create a bit of accountability because when you look back at that sort of last week or the week before and your sort of sleep time or wake time is all over the place, lack of consistency, that's a good clue that actually you could work a little bit harder on the consistency to support your circadian rhythm. So pros and cons. When I meet someone who's worried about what their tracker says, I always tell them to take it off for three weeks until they don't worry about it anymore. And then they can have it back. Alice, you wanted to come in there? Yeah, I, I just wanted to back up what Sophie's saying as someone who's done exactly that, had all the trackers. And I suppose what I think is, even if it was completely accurate, what are you going to do about it? 
you know, it tells you you didn't have that amount of sleep on that night. You did anyway. Anything, listen to what your body tells you. You And absolutely, when I'm waking up in the middle of the night, if I can't get back over using the mindfulness techniques, etc., I leave the lights off, I leave my earplugs in, I will read, I do use my phone, but I've got the blue light screen and whatnot. If that doesn't work, I get up, I go to the fridge, I have a glass of milk, I make hot buttered toast and I sit in the living room and I read my book with toast and milk and that usually shoves me over the edge. Yeah. yeah. And I, I've, I've certainly found listening to my body and not fighting it, not that what you're saying about not fighting over the sleep thing, given I'm not going to sleep, but I'll be fine. There's always a nana nap tomorrow and that, so that was all I wanted to say, Virgo. No, no, thank you very much for coming in and feel free to come in. Uh, is there such a thing as too much sleep? It kind of is, and it's sort of interesting. The, the jury is out on whether, as we get older, there's certainly population studies which follow people up over time, and they tend to say that people who get more than nine hours sleep are at increased risk of, say, stroke, heart disease, early mortality, uh, which sounds kind of bad, um, but we're not really sure exactly why. And it probably is because those are people who are getting quite a lot of poor quality sleep. So we all know that if you haven't had a great night's sleep, maybe you try and stay in bed for longer to try and catch up. And unfortunately, that can actually have a reverse effect to what you intended, which is that it confuses your circadian rhythms. Um, now, I've mentioned napping a little bit, and I don't have anything sort of any problem with short naps. By short nap, I kind of mean anything less than half an hour because that means you're in the lighter stages, stage one, stage two sleep. But as soon as you start having very long naps during the day, there is a risk that you sort of use up that sleep pressure. And when it comes to bedtime, you find it a bit harder to fall asleep or maybe harder to sleep through the night. So if you're sleeping well through the night, don't be afraid maybe of a nap, but actually, if you're struggling with sleep at night, try and compress those naps. Just experiment, again, kind of personal experience and see whether maybe a shorter nap or doing away with the nap entirely actually helps you with your sleep at night. Okay. Uh, this one from Wendy McDonald. At least once a week, I go right through the night without any sleep at all. I usually toss and turn and get five to six hours if I'm lucky. I get a heavy feeling in my chest when I'm tired going without sleep. And I do have tinnitus. It's a bit specific, but any thoughts? Um, that, that's rubbish. Uh, I know, know that experience. I've uh, experienced tinnitus before. Um, tinnitus, for those people who don't know, it's that sort of uh, feeling that you have ringing in your ears that keeps you awake at night. And the more you focus on it, the louder and more persistent it gets. And interestingly enough, some of the best treatment for tinnitus is actually cognitive behavioral therapy. So it's basically learning not to dwell on that noise because the moment that you sort of distract yourself, like most of the day, you don't really feel it. And it's only at night when it seems to type, kind of take on this massive importance. Um, so it's only through learning to focus on other things and actually just telling your, telling myself that it's, it's an artifact, it's not actually real, and that you can kind of bat it away. So these strategies such as mindfulness, which teach you to focus on, for example, your breath, and to just let thoughts, feelings go, that can be very helpful, but also um, another strategy sort of taken from the cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia toolbook and CBT for insomnia is the first line recommended treatment for insomnia. Um, things that involve writing your thoughts down and starting to kind of challenge them. So um, I recommend to some people that I work with that they take 15 minutes every day, probably after lunch, a little bit of a lull during the day, and just write down, you know, what's on your mind, particularly around sleep. What are these thoughts that keep popping into your head at two, three, four o'clock in the morning? But you've got to do this during the day, not at night when you're in kind of panic stations. And when you've written them down, imagine that you're your best friend and take each one of these thoughts and go, hmm, is that really realistic? You know, really, is tomorrow going to be a total disaster? You know, right. not. You know you've, you've coped with this before. I know you have. 
And, and the, it comes back to you, the more you worry about sleep, the worse it gets. But actually getting some of those thoughts out from your head where they drive you around the bend, putting them on a page kind of in black and white and going, OK, yeah, that's not very sensible. And just do that on a regular basis. And before long, you can start to change the narrative in your head. You can cope with your night of sleep. We all have them. Just, you know, be kind to yourself. Yeah. Uh, and Philip Baker, who written in a question, I hope that has answered uh, that question where he talked about he gets off to sleep easily enough, but only for about four hours that he finds it difficult to get back to sleep. So I think you've addressed that, that there. I'll give you one more little strategy because it's quite fun uh, and it's a quick and easy one. Um, if you wake up in the middle of the night and maybe you go to the toilet, you just kind of just you know, you're still drowsy and you can't quite drift back off to sleep, but you want to stop that annoying tsunami of thoughts kind of popping in. Say to yourself the word, the. Two seconds later, say it again. The. The. What does that do? really really boring uh, it's basically a quite effective thought blocker because it doesn't mean anything it doesn't have any kind of emotional connotations for most people uh, it's much more effective than say counting sheep so um, try a little bit of the, the, the and um, see how that goes very good Melissa asks uh, I sometimes experience a weird sleep I think I know this where I feel like I'm half asleep and half awake is that normal or anything to worry about <laughs> which I think we're trying to avoid in this conversation. Yeah, probably not going to worry about. Um, stage one sleep can be can feel like between somewhere between daydreaming and alertness. And actually, some people get that sensation of falling. Have you ever had that where you kind of suddenly wake yourself up with a jerk? Uh, I only mention this because it has a lovely term called a hypnagogic jerk, uh, which is completely harmless. But it seems to be that, you know, stage one sleep is a state where the brain is just checking if it's OK, if it's safe to fall into a full sleep. Um, so when you're in that kind of phase, um, yeah, strange things can happen. Um, but I don't think that's necessarily a problem. The more sleep deprived you are sometimes, the more your, your brain can get confused between different sleep stages. So for people who experience, say, sleepwalking, sleep talking, um, those things are much more common when you are sleep deprived or when you're quite stressed. So if you feel like those things are creeping in, that's a really good sign, that actually. You need to just make sure that these behaviours, these tips that Regina mentioned, um, that you are protecting time and creating the right conditions for sleep. Hopefully that will help, help you get back on track. OK, uh, there's one question around a specific condition again, but they're asking about sleeping under a weighted blanket with heart issues. Feels good, but also don't want to worsen my situation. Uh, I'm 37 and uh, have severe valve problems such as pulmonary tricuspid, also issues with an enlarged left ventricle. So some specifics around the heart there, I think they're asking about is, is putting a weighted blanket in comfort. Yeah, Regina, I'm happy for you to take this yeah, as well. My, my comment on, on weighted blankets would be um, there is there's not great evidence like it's very difficult sometimes to assess whether a sleep intervention is effective because one of the most effective things is to just tell someone this is going to work for you and the moment that you take away the anxiety about not sleeping someone sleeps better so I could give Fergal a smarty I could say Fergal take this smarty and you're going to sleep really well and he will probably fall asleep 10 minutes faster so if your friend has re recommended a weighted blanket say and you start using it you might start sleeping better and there's still a question about is it really this weighted blanket or is it just that you feel good that you're doing something helpful now there is a good kind of rationale for weighted blankets that there's kind of deep Precious stimulation. It's supposed to be a bit like giving someone a hug. Uh, and if it can help to produce oxytocin, which is the hormone of connection, that's a lovely way to switch off the stress response. Hugs are awesome, by the way. Um, but the, I think the risk with a weighted blanket is if you get too hot. Because one of the surefire ways to interfere with deep sleep is to be too hot, as we all know in a heat wave um, so if you feel like you're managing to regulate your body temperature okay um, and it feels good to you I don't have an issue with weighted blankets but I'll, I'll hand that over to Regina there, there's no issue with regards to your heart, the heart conditions you mentioned and using a weighted blanket so um, if it feels good to you and helps you go to go to sleep then absolutely there's no I, I don't know of any reason why you wouldn't 
uh, use a weighted blanket to because of the heart issues that you mentioned about your valves and your large heart uh, left ventricle. Okay, Regina, thank you very much. Alice, thank you very much. Sophie, thank you too. And thank you all for watching this edition of Live and Ticking. We hope you've enjoyed hearing from all of our brilliant speakers. Um, as always, we'd like to do the poll question again. So how would you rate your understanding now of how sleep uh, affects uh, the heart? If, if we haven't managed to answer your questions today, and I know there were one or two we didn't get to, but I felt that they were covered in, in previous answers as well. But uh, we still encourage you to visit our Heart Helpline where you can contact our dedicated clinical team about your query. All our incredible research is funded 100% by you, the public. If you've been inspired by the amazing science you've heard today, then all donations to support our life-saving work are very much appreciated. There's a link to donate should you wish to do so at the end of the event. Live and Ticking is a monthly webinar series and we strive to produce the best events possible for you, our audience. Your feedback and comments are crucial to help plan and develop future events. So we ask if you can complete the survey at the end of this event through an email you'll receive in the coming days. This Live and Ticking event was recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel from next week. Our next event will take place on the 30th of, 30th of August on the genetics of obesity and the heart. Thanks again for joining us and goodbye.